How was the exam? How many thought they did well? Nobody's going to sit in front of their friends, right? <laughs> How'd you like the format? <laughs> you guys are in a pretty good mood today. Any thoughts? Feedback? What's that? You like writing it out. Yeah. Nasty matching. Okay, other thoughts? One of the reasons the format changes is that we don't have calculations this term. So that's what tended to drive that other format uh, where calculations and more involved processes, things this term tend to be briefer. And so um, the exam questions don't cover as much material. And that's part of the reason for doing that. Another reason is because there's no recitations, I don't have TAs, and so grading, uh, has to, we have to simplify that also. So both of those combine to uh, give us this format. Anybody have time as an issue? Yeah, generally not in this course. Okay, uh, they're not graded yet. Um, I uh, will be talking to TAs soon. I don't anticipate they'll be ready today. I wish they were, but I don't think they will be. So um, it'll probably be Monday, and I'll let you know as soon as I know, as always. Okay. Uh, I want to finish up talking about the movement of cholesterol and uh, lipids, other lipids, in the body uh, today. And I'll go back and talk about that little bit of regulation that I didn't talk about with cholesterol before. And uh, then we'll talk about some other byproducts of cholesterol. And then we'll start on fatty acid oxidation. So um, a fair amount to get on our, uh, on our plate today. Uh, last time I went through uh, at least the first parts of this uh, schematic, uh, saying that you've just eaten a Big Mac and you've absorbed uh, through your intestines, you have absorbed uh, some lipids. These include fats, they include fatty acids, they include cholesterol, they include uh, fat-soluble vitamins. Basically things that are water-insoluble are what's in this little mix that's there. Those, I said, got packaged up by the um, uh, lymph system into chylomicrons and the chylomicrons went out got broken down to remnants, and the remnants uh, made it back to the liver, okay? And the liver um, had a little receptor there that grabbed a hold of these and says, okay, I'm going to internalize them, and um, it did. Now, I said we have some factors contributing to um, the uptake of these, and these include, some of these factors include how uh, much capacity the liver has to hold uh, onto lipids how much capacity it has to hold on to some of those lipids, including cholesterol, and last, how much the body is needing. And so it was about that point where I finished last time, and I said that the body, uh, your, your liver has to um, respond to needs, and it has to uh, basically deliver lipids, and, um, which include cholesterol, uh, to target tissues when they need it. So the way that the liver does this is it dumps out into the bloodstream. It actually packages up a new um, lipoprotein called a VLDL. And that VLDL stands for very low density uh, lipoprotein. And I described how the VLDLs go out, they get chewed up, and as they get chewed up, they get smaller and smaller until they get to LDLs. And I said that LDLs were what your doctor calls the bad cholesterol because it has, A, the highest percentage of cholesterol uh, present, but B, uh, also because it's these guys, the LDLs, that are linked to the formation of atherosclerotic plaques. So LDLs play a role in atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis leads to heart attack, leads to stroke. And they're basic, when we talk about plugging of the arteries, that's what we're talking about. Okay? Well, I haven't gotten to how the liver uh, controls things, so I want to do that, and then I'll come back and talk about uh, the formation of atherosclerotic plaques. The liver has put out some VLDLs. And the liver needs to know, have I put out enough? Have I not put out enough? And the way the liver does this is it measures the amount of LDLs that come back to the liver. Okay? It measures the amount of LDLs that come back to the liver. And unfortunately, that isn't directly shown on this figure. Okay? The liver has a receptor on it called an LDL receptor. Now, if everything's working great, 
Here's what happens. The liver puts out a bunch of VLDLs. They get used by the body. And if they get used by the body, what's going to happen to the amount of LDLs that's going to be left? Well, it's going to be low. So the liver looks at this, and it asks its receptors, hey, are the, um, is the LDL concentration high or is it low? Okay. If the LDL concentration is high, the liver says, oh, the tissues don't need stuff. I'm going to quit putting out VLDLs. If the LDL concentration is low, the liver says, oh, the tissues are starving, and it puts out more VLDLs. All right? So the liver uses the amount of binding to the LDL receptor as an indicator of the body's need of lipids. Okay? The more that gets bound, the more, uh, uh, the less it puts out. All right? The less that gets bound, the more it puts out. All right? Well, why do people have high cholesterol then? Well, there's a couple of reasons. One reason is if the liver is at capacity, it can't really absorb more. It's going to be putting out things as fast as it can because, hey, I've got no room to store stuff, right? You probably have stuff in your parents' house somewhere. Your old bedroom is all packed with your stuff. And you said, oh, wow, I got this whole bunch of new stuff that I bought for my apartment. Can I put my other stuff in the apartment? And your parents are going to say, okay, but something else is going to have to go, right? That's what happens here. So if the liver is already at capacity, that's going to be a factor. That's why I said we think about diet in terms of how much um, you can reduce or that is, increase your liver's capacity, but reduce these uh, other things that are out here by your diet. And if you can't change that with your diet, then we go to other things. So diet's a first approach. Another factor that will contribute to the cholesterol levels will be how well do the LDLs bind to these receptors. Okay. Now, the LDL receptors that the liver has are very much like, but not identical to LDL receptors that are on the other tissues. Remember, other tissues are grabbing those LDLs and they're internalizing them, and that's how they're getting cholesterol directly into them. That's the only way they get cholesterol in is through those tissue LDL receptors. The liver's LDL receptors are different. Okay? So if there's something that prohibits the liver's LDL receptor from binding to LDLs, What's going to happen? Well, the liver will never know what the LDL levels are. In fact, the liver, if it can't bind to the receptor properly, is always going to be putting out more VLDLs because it says, wow, these tissues are just starving. Meanwhile, the LDL levels are floating up here pretty high. So if your LDL receptor isn't perfect at binding those LDLs, that can be a contributing factor. Now, in extreme cases, and I'm going to show you extreme cases in just a second, there's a genetic disease called familial hypercholesterolemia. I'm not going to spell that. It's in your, I'll put it in the highlights. You'll see it. But it's a genetic disease in which a person's LDL receptors on the liver are gone. Totally non-functional. Okay? It's extraordinarily rare. And interestingly enough, in this class, uh, about seven or eight years ago, I had a student that came up to me after class, and she said, I know about that. My kids got it. And I said, no way. Because what happens is it's a it's, it's very, very rare disease, and children who get it typically are dead by the age of 10. They die of heart attack because their body is putting out so much VLDLs and LDLs are made as a consequence that uh, they... Uh, the atherosclerotic plaques form, and they die of heart attack stroke by a very early age. She said, no, I'm sure he has it. I said, okay, all right. So she goes and she checks, and she comes back and says, yep, that's what he's got. And I said, really? So I asked her for her story, and she said, well, when he was uh, about six or seven years old, he had these sores that started appearing on him. And I took him to the doctor. The doctor says, oh, you know, he's got pus or he's got whatever. He doesn't know what it is. And, you know, they never seem to get better. They never seem to get better. Finally, they fortunately get this kid in front of a doctor who says, you know what those sores are? And I'm going to show you these sores. It's, it's not gross. It's not gross. Okay. This is what they look like. Okay. Those were cholesterol. Okay. Well, fortunately, the doctor recognized and had the kid tested to see if he had hypercholesterolemia. And, in fact, he did. 
They checked his LDL levels in the bloodstream, okay? And where 200 would be considered a fairly, a relatively high amount that they would put you on medication for, this kid's level was 700. I said, you're kidding, you know? Well, it's a happy ending to the story, actually, a very happy ending. They recognized it, they treated it, and the age of um, a person dying of hypercholesterolemia pretty much changed dramatically when they got the statin drugs and other drugs that can actually physically lower cholesterol levels. So they took this kid, they put him on every statin and every drug that they could that lowered the cholesterol levels, and with that, his cholesterol levels are down to about 200 or so, where uh, it's a much more normal level, and the kid's going to live a normal life. So that's kind of a cool story. Uh, I couldn't believe I actually met somebody, knew somebody had this, because it's on the order of, they estimate maybe two or three people in the country, uh, you know, in the U.S. might have it at a given time. So it's a pretty, pretty rare uh, disorder. Happy ending, though. Okay, so that's what happens if your liver LDL receptors are not functioning. The liver no, does, has no way of knowing what's out there. Okay, so it just keeps putting more and more and more out. The liver gets pretty tired uh, of all of that. Okay, uh, let's see. What else did I want to say about that? Um, that's an atherosclerotic plaque. That's probably even more gross. How does an atherosclerotic plaque form? I said it forms from LDLs, and one of the ways uh, in which it forms is it appears that LDLs are susceptible to um, reactive oxygen species, more so than the other lipoprotein complexes are. That means that they can be much more readily oxidized when they encounter reactive oxygen. We've seen reactive oxygen in mitochondria, and we've said, well, we've got these enzymes that deal with that. Okay. Well, if the reactive oxygen species wins the race, you're in trouble. Inside of cells, I've got superoxide dismutase. Outside of cells, what do I have? Not as much. Outside of cells, reactive oxygen species are going to be bad. Guess who has high concentrations of reactive oxygen species in their blood? Smokers. Okay? Those are extracellular. Much more likely, they're going to have oxidation of their LDLs. When oxidation of LDLs occurs, okay, a variety of things can happen, but one of the things that can happen is that that can damage a part of the artery where the LDL is located. The LDL may, may get stuck to the artery as a result of that. And that forms the, the basis by which the atherosclerotic plaque happens. Because what happens is the immune system looks at that damaged LDL, that damaged artery, and says, oh, We've got a problem. Let's go attack it. The immune system attacks it with macrophages. That binds one LDL, that binds more, and what happens is they accumulate. You form what are called foam cells because they're rich in these macrophages, they're rich in the LDLs, they're loaded with cholesterol, and they start to grow and they block the artery. Okay? So it's for that reason that your doctor calls LDL the bad cholesterol. It actually... Uh, is much more likely you're going to have damage happen as a result of reactive oxygen species and you're going to have this formation of this mass that's going to happen as a result of that. That's the bad news. The good news is that there's also a cholesterol that your doctor calls good cholesterol. And that's what's actually shown back here on the um, fates. Okay? And you see HDL. Okay? HDL is a little hard to understand, and HDL is basically a scavenging form of lipoprotein complexes. It's grabbing pieces that haven't been, done pro haven't been uh, handled properly. It can actually help to scavenge LDLs uh, or pieces of LDLs that are there and will physically lower the problem molecules in your bloodstream. Your doctor is going to be happy if your HDL levels are high. Okay? Your doctor's going to be happy if your HDL levels are high because that means a lot of stuff is getting hauled back to the liver that would otherwise cause problems for you. How do you increase your HDL levels? Exercise. Stop smoking because smoking will lower HDLs and smoking will elevate LDLs. And diet. Okay? If we look at... Uh, uh, diets that are richer in unsaturated fatty acids, polyunsaturated fatty acids, we s they tend to associate those with higher levels of HDL and lower levels of LDL. If it goes saturated, it tends to reverse that. Question? 
Yeah, are they effective at taking apart the plaques once formed, or do they just filter out the solution? Yeah, our, our uh, HDL is effective at taking a plaque apart the plaques once they form. To my knowledge, no, but I actually have heard of certain diets that may be linked to that. So I can't say an absolute no to that question. So HDLs are really what you want to get going. Probably the best way to get your HDLs high is exercise. Exercise, exercise, exercise. Okay? You want a good prescription for health, that's the good place to start. Okay. So those are the uh, considerations for the movement of cholesterol uh, in the body. Um, I want to come back and talk about this regulatory pathway, and there's a little bit of complexity to that that I can show you. Um, when we think about the regulation of the levels of synthesis of cholesterol in our body, remember we're talking about synthesis now, not movement, but synthesis. And by the way, I think I said before, but if I didn't, I'll say again here. There are three considerations for levels of cholesterol in your body. Three considerations, okay? Number one, you have to think about how much your body is making. Second, you think about how much you're getting in the diet. And third, you think about how much you've got stored. Those three are very important to think about. Okay? Dietary cholesterol okay, can be controlled by your diet, obviously. Synthesis of cholesterol can be controlled to some extent with statins, statins, whatever you want to call them, S-T-A-T-I-N-S. All right? The body has a complex regulatory system for controlling the synthesis of cholesterol. I've told you part of that. I talked about HMG-CoA reductase and how HMG-CoA reductase was a regulatory enzyme in route to synthesis of cholesterol. I said it was feedback inhibited, meaning that the enzyme was turned off as the concentration of cholesterol accumulated. But there's other things that help control cholesterol synthesis. All right? So what I'm getting ready to show you right now is controlling how HMG-CoA reductase is even made. Okay? So that's what this figure here is showing us. How do we control whether or not it's made? Because remember, that's one of the ways we can control an enzyme, whether or not it's made. All right. Well, to understand this, we have to understand a couple sets of membrane proteins. All right? There's a couple sets of membrane proteins. One's called SCAP, and the other's called SREBP, sterol response element binding protein. You'll probably call it SREBP. Now, SREBP appears in three different forms on this figure. And this is where students get confused. I'm going to call this SREBPA. I'm going to call this, uh, this form here SREBPB. And I'm going to call this form SREBPC. You'll see why I do that in a second. Okay? This figure isn't completely clear, in my opinion. All right. When we have uh, levels of cholesterol in the body that are low, we see what happens in this picture. When cholesterol levels in the body are low, the body says, I need to synthesize some cholesterol. What happens? Well, we're looking at the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum right here. And the membrane of the endoplasmic reticulum, we have the scap, which has a portion of itself that binds to the SREBPA. SREBPA is the one that's completely intact. Okay? As long as the cholesterol levels aren't low, this, we have this staying at the top. When cholesterol levels start to fall, okay, what we see is there's a serine protease that comes in and it basically cuts SREBP into two pieces. That generates SREB, I'm sorry, SREBPA into two pieces. One of these pieces is over here. It's called SREBPB. And we see that it's no longer tied to this SCAP protein. Notice this is also, I, sh I should also point out, I didn't say this. When cholesterol levels fall, this whole complex is transferred to the Golgi. It's transferred to the Golgi. It's in the Golgi where this serine protease resides. Okay? So when cholesterol levels fall, this complex of this membrane gets transferred to the membrane of the Golgi, and now the serine protease comes along and does a number on SREBPA, creating SREBPB. 
SRADPB is free to move in the membrane. It's no longer tied to this scap. Okay, it's no longer tied to the scap. So it can go over here and interact with another protein, an enzyme in the membrane called a metalloprotease. You saw an example of that last term. And the metalloprotease will clip off SREBPC. So now we've got this little piece that's, that's, that, that, that is free to go. This is the place where the figure gets uh, a little inaccurate. Right? SREBPC is a transcription factor, meaning it's a protein that binds to a specific promoter sequence in the DNA. I'll repeat that. SREBPC is a transcription factor. When it's released, it can go to the DNA and bind to a specific promoter in the nucleus, in the DNA. That promoter, and that's what's confusing here, the promoter is called SRE, sterile response element. So SREBPC is the blue guy. It is bound to a portion of the DNA called the SRE. And when SREBPC binds to the SRE, transcription occurs. And guess where SRE occurs? It's the promoter for HMG CoA reductase. So what we see is when cholesterol levels are falling, we're releasing a transcription factor that goes to the nucleus. It turns on the transcription of HMG CoA reductase, and that's a critical enzyme for making cholesterol. I'll slow down, let you write that down, and I'll also take any questions. Jody? Do those portions reassemble or are they resynthesized? These portions do not reassemble, no. Everybody got that? It's a lot of stuff there. And it's not the best figure. That's why I call it A, B, and C, because I think that uh, helps you to see what's there. All right, so SREBPC has bound to the sterile response element that's a sequence in the DNA that's ahead of the HMG-CoA reductase gene. It goes, it turns on that gene, bang, you can start making cholesterol. Yes, sir? And cholesterol will in turn feed back the um, HMG-CoA reductase, and I'm going to show you one other thing it does in a second as well. Okay? Okay, so... That's a lot of material there. Let's take a, a, another look at how this guy controls things. Okay? So we're back looking at SCAP again. All right, there's our SREBPA. This is depicting what's happening when we have a lot of cholesterol. When we have a lot of cholesterol, this guy is interacting with a protein called NSIG. There are different NSIGs that are out there. Okay? This is one of them. NSIG, if there's a lot of cholesterol, will prevent the movement to the Golgi. NSIG will prevent the movement to the Golgi. So that process you saw on the last slide will not happen if cholesterol levels are high. If cholesterol levels fall, this detachment occurs because NSIG only interacts when cholesterol is found in here. Cholesterol levels fall, this gets detached, and then this guy goes over to the Golgi, and what you saw in the last slide happens. Okay, so this is a way of using cholesterol levels to control what happens to SREBPA. Okay, now there's one last thing that cholesterol can stimulate, and that's actually the degradation of HMG-CoA reductase. So now we've seen, I mean, this, is a, this tells us that we, there's several very important things about this enzyme, okay? We control how it's synthesized. We control how this guy's allosterically regulated, right? Cholesterol can turn it off. We control how much of it is by breaking it down and I'm going to show you that in this slide. And last, we control this enzyme by 
by um, covalent modification. Phosphorylation turns off, turns off HMG CoA reductase. It can be phosphorylated, and when that happens, it's turned off. So four ways of controlling that enzyme. I'm going to repeat them because I know you probably didn't get them the first time around. Okay. We control synthesis. We control it allosterically. We control its rate of degradation. And we control it by covalent modification. Four different ways. That tells us this enzyme is very, very, very important to our body. Okay. So let me take you through this slide, and then uh, we'll be uh, done with this. All right? All right. Here is uh, the membrane of a cell that has in it HMG coi reductase. It's a membrane protein. In the membrane of the cell, there are another uh, group of NSIGs. You see it right here. Okay? Another group of NSIGs that uh, is associated with what are called ubiquitinating enzymes. Okay? Ubiquitinating enzymes. What are ubiquitinating enzymes? Ubiquitinating enzymes play roles in controlling degradation of proteins. Now, I want to make a, a, a clarification here because somebody asked me something earlier in the week that they were a little confused on this as well. There's a difference between ubiquitination and ubiquinone. Ubiquinone is a molecule. Ubiquitin, which is what's happening here, is a, is, is a protein. It's a small peptide. Okay? Coenzyme Q is also called ubiquinone. Also called ubiquinone. So don't confuse that with what's happening here. That's not the, nothing, nothing related to that. Okay? Now, what's happening? Well, when cholesterol levels are high, these guys associate. You see sterols. That means there's plenty of things like cholesterol, like lanosterol, like various things that end in OL. When these are high, this association between NSIG and the HMG Kuwait um, reductase occurs. That brings these guys in place, and it starts putting on this small peptide onto HMG CoA reductase. What that is is a target for degradation. It's actually like a flag that the cell uses that says, destroy me. This dis destruction tag is used by many different enzymes in the body. The body has uh, proteins that have a lifetime, and that lifetime is governed partly by how long it is before they get degraded. And the signal for degradation is ubiquitin. All right, so once this guy gets this on here, we see that HMG CoA reductase gets destroyed and we're gone. Okay? So what that means then is as cholesterol levels are high, again, we're going to see destruction of the enzyme. Questions about that? And easy. I'm, I'm not quite sure I heard it, but, uh, but I think you said, does this contribute to cholesterol levels in the blood? Yeah, like if this is properly. Yeah. So, yeah, it's a good question. Basically, anything that is affecting the synthesis of cholesterol, and this definitely affects the synthesis of cholesterol, will have a role in cholesterol levels in the blood. Okay, so when we take a drug like a statin, we're inhibiting this enzyme allosterically. Okay, one of the four ways in which we can stop this enzyme. This, because of this ubiquitination system, does indeed play a role in controlling how much of the enzyme is available for for a control. Okay, Jody. Are there any other non-statin drug classes that are used primarily, or at least quite often, to control it by one of the other methods? So his question is, are there other drugs that are used to control by other methods? And he's unfortunately opening a can of worms. So I'll, I'll, I'll answer his question and not hold you responsible for it. How's that? This way you can think, oh, well, I love the knowledge, right? Yeah, there are other things, other strategies for lowering cholesterol that involve other drugs. All right? And one of them is uh, what's known as recycling. Okay? 
So our body, in addition to making cholesterol, the only way we get rid of cholesterol is by excreting it in our feces. Okay? And our intestines um, have further down in them an ability to reabsorb cholesterol, to do recycling. So one of the strategies for lowering cholesterol is to increase fecal excretion, and to do that, you inhibit the reabsorption by the intestine. It doesn't have anything to do with these four methods, but it's a fifth method that is in, involved in controlling cholesterol levels. And that one turns out to be very effective, and it's used in those rare cases where statins either don't work or where people have uh, reactions as a result of statins. The kid I told you about was taking both inhibitors of reabsorption and in, uh, of, of the HMG chlorodectase statins as well. Okay? So yes, there's other, other things that can be done in that. I don't know of anything that specifically targets this. No. Yes, Connie. Well, liver cells are going to play a, a big role in, in this cholesterol metabolism. So this liver cells would be a good example, but that's not the only place that cholesterol is made. Yeah. Okay. That is uh, a complex story. Cholesterol, as I told you, is a compl complicated molecule, and it is a molecule that is still being actively studied. I think I've mentioned in this class before. There are five Nobel Prizes that have been won for cholesterol, and people still haven't got cholesterol all figured out. So a lot of things going on there. The last things I want to say about cholesterol are the metabolites of cholesterol. So cholesterol is not an endpoint. Okay? We use cholesterol in our membranes, but that's not the only thing that we do with cholesterol in our bodies. Okay? I referred earlier to the synthesis of bile salts. I didn't show you what they are, but I will show you what they are now. Okay? Bile salts, you may recall, are these detergent-like molecules that are present in our stomach that help us to emulsify fat when we eat it. I said it was important that we convert that fat into something that was soluble in water, and the way to do that was with detergent. These are the detergents, okay? Glycocholate, tarocholate, there are other examples. This is just two of them. And these molecules are made from cholesterol. Cholesterol is not very water-soluble at all, but when it gets these groups put on them, there's a, hydro there's a carboxyl group there, some additional OHs on there, there's a sulfate over here, excuse me, and some additional OHs over here. These molecules are, in fact, much more water-soluble than cholesterol is, and so they actually help in that emulsification process. Okay? So bile, bile acids or bile salts, you can call them either one as far as I'm concerned, are made from cholesterol, play very important roles in the um, um, digestion process. Another... Um, thing that cholesterol is used for is to make steroid hormones. Okay? There are several classes of steroid hormones, and you will see in this category here that cholesterol is a precursor of something called pregnenolone, and pregnenolone gives rise to the major classes of steroid hormones, the glucocorticoids, mineralocorticoids, androgens, the male sex hormones, and estrogens, the female sex hormones. Okay? I think I've got a figure showing here, okay? Um, I want to focus on one component of that steroid hormone synthesis, and that is the synthesis of female sex hormones from male sex hormones, okay? So the male sex hormones um, are the androgens as a uh, category, and here's testosterone, another related one called andro androstenedione uh, here, all right? If we look at what's happening in going from either testosterone to estradiol or androstenedione to estrone, we see that in each case a benzene ring is being formed. Okay? This is a very unusual reaction, a very unusual reaction. In all of biology, there's only a handful of places where benzene rings are made in a ring where there wasn't one before. Very, very rare reaction, okay? The enzyme that catalyzes this formation of the benzene ring is called an aromatase, A-R-O-M-A-T-A-S-E. Female sex hormones, the production of female sex hormones requires action of this enzyme known as aromatase. Now, it turns out that there are tumors that are responsive to female sex hormones. 
And yes, guys, you have some of these too. Okay? There are tumors that are responsive to these. For example, if there are, and, and uh, some, many of these are breast cancer tumors, although there are other tumors as well, that will have a receptor on their surface that if it binds to estradiol, for example, it will stimulate the growth of that tumor. Okay? It's very easy to test for. If you, get a, if you have a tumor, a doctor will likely do a test to see, and one of the questions they will ask is, is it, uh, um, is it estradiol sensitive or estrogen sensitive? If it is, then they've got a tool to uh, work on. The tool is they give a person who has a tumor that's estrogen sensitive, they give them aromatase inhibitors. That stops the production of female sex hormones and literally starts starving the tumor. The tumor responds to it, you take it away, the tumor doesn't have the same stimulus that it had before, it becomes much more treatable. Okay? So this could be used after removal of a tumor, so if you're worried about other similar cells being present in the body, an aromatase inhibitor uh, could be very useful uh, in that regard. Okay? Will this cause a person to go through menopause, female? Yes, it will. Yes, it will. Okay. Cholesterol is an important molecule. I'm not done with it yet. The last thing I'll talk about with cholesterol synthesis is synthesis of another steroid. We don't always think about it as a steroid, but it is. In fact, in general, we talk about steroids as derivatives from cholesterol, things that are made from cholesterol. And vitamin D is a steroid in that category. Vitamin D is made from cholesterol. Here's 7-dehydrocholesterol. That is a precursor of vitamin D. Vitamin D, as you can see, um, comes from this. All right? Ultraviolet light plays a role in the synthesis of pre-vitamin D. One of the reasons I would recommend you get some sunshine is so that your body can naturally make vitamin D. You can get enough vitamin D okay, with just a few minutes of sunshine a day just by this process, because ultraviolet light makes this pre-vitamin, which your body can convert to this, and this spontaneously forms the active form of vitamin D known as calcitriol. If you give the body this, you got that. So to get to this, you've got to have ultraviolet light. If you're not getting enough ultraviolet light, okay, then you probably need to take a vitamin supplement and vitamin D is a vitamin that we're finding increasingly that people are very deficient in. Very deficient in. I take vitamin D supplement, for example, because I found I was deficient in vitamin D. And vitamin D is very important for healthy bones. It's necessary for the proper absorption of calcium and phosphate from your digestive system. If you're low in vitamin D, you're absorbed. You can have all the calcium that you want in your diet, but it's not going to make it in. You're going to have weak bones. Now, it's very important, especially for young women, to get plenty of vitamin D because what happens is you develop osteoporosis, fragile bones. You only see them when you're 60s, 70s, 80s. You start developing it now, right now. If you're not getting sufficient vitamin D right now, you won't know it, but you've already started yourself on a path to osteoporosis. I take plenty of calcium. You can take all the calcium in the world, and that's not going to do you any good if you don't have vitamin D. Okay? So get your vitamin D levels checked, get sunshine, and if you need to, take a supplement, and the supplement bypasses that ultraviolet light requirement because the supplement comes in this form. Okay? Word to the wise. Okay, believe it or not, I'm done with cholesterol. And I've got 10 minutes to get into fatty acid oxidation, unless there are questions. Are there questions before I go forward? Yeah, Jared? Uh, told me that excess, vitamin D excess vitamin D is not good, so you don't want to overload on vitamin D. It's not the same as vitamin A. Vitamin A will kill you if you have too much. Okay? But you don't want to have too much vitamin D. That's right. So you don't want to just go out and start gobbling vitamin D. And that's why I recommend getting your vitamin D levels checked and then periodically having them checked. But if you feel like, well, I'm not getting enough sunshine and I'm not getting out as much as I should and maybe my levels are low, a little bit will be okay. Yeah. Connie? I'm assuming we have like lots of free UV light for vitamin D in our body. 
in general, you do have plenty of the pre-vitamin D levels in your body, yes. Uh, and that actually makes me think of another, another point. Uh, people with dark skin will tend to have more difficulty making this because the dark skin blocks that to some extent. So, peop so people with dark skin who live in northern latitudes, like here, uh, like my, Indira, for example, had her vitamin D levels very low. My wife is from India. And her light levels were very low. And she gets you know, a fair amount of sun and so forth. So it, it, that, that is a factor. But, but uh, yes, you, you um, I forget what your original question was, but. Uh, Oh, the pre, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, you have plenty of the pre, yeah, yeah. Is vitamin D more essential than calcium? Is vitamin D more essential than calcium? No, they, you have to have both. Because uh, without, uh, I mean, I, if the question is, should I take vitamin D and I don't take any calcium, am I still going to get osteoporosis? Anytime you have a limiting uh, amount of material to make bones, you're going to have a problem. So, so I wouldn't say that you can take vitamin D and not consider your calcium levels, no. I think you should factor that into it as well. Well, don't they fortify most milk products with that now? Do they fortify most milk products with vitamin D? They do in many cases. Many people don't drink milk. So that's also a consideration. But it pays, it seriously pays to have your levels checked. Because what we're finding, not we, because I don't do it, but what people are finding is that vitamin D levels of all the vitamins are probably the one that's most likely to be low in you. So that's a real concern, especially in young people. So young people get out there. Other questions? Okay. Let's uh, get start on fatty acid oxidation, at least, OK? Try to keep us reasonably on schedule here. I know there's a lot of material today. Fatty acid metabolism is um, actually fairly straightforward. What you're going to see as I talk about fatty acid metabolism is that the pathway of synthesis is very much like the reversal of the pathway of oxidation. There are differences, but the chemistry of it is almost identical. The chemistry of synthesis is almost identical to the reverse of oxidation. So we focus first on um, the fatty acids, how they're produced uh, from fat, and then we'll turn our attention to oxidation. Fat, by the way, in the body is stored in specialized cells called adipocytes. That's an adipocyte full of fat. Fat is, remember, water insoluble, so it's not surprising the body has specialized tissues to handle fat. And again, those are called adipocytes. What we're going to be talking about uh, mostly on Monday, I'll talk about it briefly today, is the process of oxidation versus synthesis. If we look at the two processes, on the left we see oxidation, and that starts at the top and goes down. On the right we have synthesis, and that starts at the bottom and moves up. And if you look at the chemistry, and I'm going to just talk you through it very briefly here. We'll look at this more closely later. We see that they are very, very similar. Here's a saturated fatty acid. Here's a saturated fatty acid. This is an end product. This is a starting product. To go from here down to here involves removal of hydrogens and electrons from between two carbons. We saw that in the succinate dehydrogenase reaction. Now we see it in fatty acid oxidation. Look at that. Make a double bond. By the way, one of the things you'll notice in these two pathways that's, that's completely in common is all the action between carbons two and three. Carbon number one being here, carbon number two being here, carbon number three being there. All the action is between carbons two and three. Everything happens between carbons two and three. OK, we make a double bond going down. Look at this going upwards. We reduce a double bond. This is an oxidation. This is a reduction. Next step, we add water. That's just like when we went from succinate to fumarate, right? Succinate to fumarate, we added water. That got that OH on there, and that's what we're doing right here. Goes on carbon number three. And this guy, we have dehydration. We're taking water away to make that double bond. We oxidize that OH going down to make a ketone. We reduce a ketone going up to make that OH. In the last step, we do what's called thiolytic cleavage, meaning that we use an enzyme called thiolase to break that bond between carbons two and three again. That gives us a two-carbon piece known as 
as uh, acetyl-CoA and a fatty acid that's two shorter. If we're synthesizing it, that's one exception here. When we're synthesizing, we actually start with a three-carbon piece, and we'll talk about that later. But basically, this process is the reverse of this process, at least from a chemical perspective. Very, very similar to being opposite directions. Yes, sir? Are the carbon-free intermediates right there, stereo centers, actually inverted? The stereo centers are inverted. Okay, so structurally, they're different. All right, and I'll talk about that later. But in terms of the chemistry that's happening here, the, it, it's simply reversal. Okay. Well, um, before we finish today, I want to say a little bit about how we get fatty acids, and that's. Uh, let me see. Actually, I've got a couple minutes. Uh, that we'll, we'll we'll see how that head it goes. All right. There's glycocholate. Where did you just see glycocholate? It's bile acid, right? And necessary to emulsify fat. We have fat in our digestive enzymes. And we have, I'm sorry, we have fat in our digestive system, and we have enzymes both in our digestive system and in our cells that will break down fats. They're called lipases. Some lipases are extracellular. Some lipases are intracellular. What you see happening on the screen here are extracellular. Okay. I'll show you an intracellular one in a second. It does very similar stuff. But lipases use water to clip fatty acids off of a fat. You start with a triacylglycerol, you clip off a fatty acid, you're left with a diacylglycerol. You take a diacylglycerol, you clip off a fatty acid, you're left with a monoacylglycerol. And I'm sure you can figure out that if you take the monoacylglycerol and you clip off a fatty acid, you get glycerol. As I said, these can happen extracellularly or intracellularly. Okay. Something curious happens with the um, absorption of fat. Okay. Here's fat. Here's that Big Mac that we ate. It's coming down our digestive system. We're right in our digestive system here, in our intestines. Here's fat. It's got to get from the intestine out so it can get packaged up as chylomicrons, right? How do we get it out? Do we just push it out? It turns out we don't. First, we do that thing I just showed you. The lipases break it down to fatty acids and monoacylglycerols. Why do you suppose they break it down first? It turns out what they do is they reassemble it once they get across. Any thoughts about why that might happen? What do fatty acids do? Regulation would be a good guess, but it's not the right one. Fatty acids act as detergents, don't they? It's actually the fat is being broken down to help emulsify the remainder of the fat to get it across the membrane. Once it's gotten across the membrane, it's like, okay, now we're ready to handle you. We build you back into a fat, and now we're going to put you into a chylomicron. Okay? So they're broken down to two fatty acids plus a monoacylglycerol. They're put together over here and then built into a chylomicron. Okay, so we've gotten fat out of the, again, we've gotten fat out of the digestive system and into our body. Inside of fat cells, fat cells have their internal lipases that will break down, do the same reaction. Here is a triacylglycerol. It'll clip off all three of the fatty acids, and those three fatty acids can be dumped into the bloodstream where they get picked up by which protein? Pop quiz. Which protein carries fatty acids in the bloodstream? I just talked about it last time. You guys were thinking about the exam. You weren't thinking about this, were you? Serum albumin. Serum albumin carries fatty acids. Why do we need a protein to carry fatty acids in our bloodstream? Fatty acids act as detergents. Do we want detergents floating around in our bloodstream? We don't. Okay. I think we are at a stopping point. Let's stop there, and we'll see how this is regulated next time. I'm sorry? Which one of those components would be the target of orlistatin? Tar target of what? Orlistatin ally? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. Sorry. I didn't know if it would be the lipases or some of the bigger stuff. I don't know. Sorry, sorry Charlie.